Um, and that brings us to the last talk of today. So it's uh, my pleasure to announce John Chalker about, we'll talk about many body localization as an introspective. Okay, thanks. Uh, so obviously uh, this topic is a bit of an outlier at the conference. Uh, it's very nice to be here and uh, I'm grateful to the organizers for sanctioning the subject. Um, actually, yesterday, uh, Piers Coleman in the introduction to his talk mentioned that there's a school going on in the main building, which is more quantum information focused. And so perhaps you could think of this as uh, news from the other side. Um, but if Piers is listening, then I'd like to reassure him that two of the lecture courses at that summer school are uh, firstly on Fermi liquids and secondly on frustrated magnetism. So these two branches haven't uh, completely separated yet. Um, so I want to talk about many body localization and the transition to an ergodic phase. And I guess I'm assuming that uh, people will know what I mean by those words. Um, and my main point is going to be that whereas many body localization and this phase transition is generally held up as being quite distinct from say the thermal phase transitions that we're familiar with, uh, there is actually a way of looking at things uh, in the language of symmetry breaking. And it's uh, that approach that, that I want to talk about. Um, I felt I should say a little bit to set things in a broader context. So um, I'll be talking about random quantum circuits and I'll spend a couple of minutes first uh, introducing quantum circuits and, and also mentioning other things that people have been using them to study. Um, but then the particular content of the talk is uh, thinking about the spectral form factor, which is a way of uh, discussing uh, energy level correlations or uh, eigenvalue correlations um, and how it behaves as you go through the many body localization transition. Uh, and then it sounds rather technical, but I hope I can get it across. I want to talk about a transfer matrix which generates this spectral form factor and how the behavior of the transfer matrix as you go across the transition uh, involves exactly the features that one usually uh, associates with symmetry breaking. And then finally, I'll try and explain what this symmetry breaking involves. And the limitation is that it's very much something internal to the calculation, uh, although I'll argue in the introduction that it's a, a kind of phenomenon that we're quite familiar with in a lot of different contexts. Um, it involves the Feynman paths that contribute to the spectral form factor that uh, I'll introduce. Um, so I think there have been real advances in thinking about um, dynamics in many body quantum systems uh, in a high temperature, highly excited regime. And the point is that while traditionally we've uh, thought about what happens at long times in terms of hydrodynamics for conserved quantities, um, we now have ways of thinking about equilibration of an isolated system evolving under the usual unitary dynamics of, uh, of quantum mechanics um, in terms of uh, other slow degrees of freedom aside from the ones that are connected with local conservation laws. Uh, and this involves the uh, dynamics of entanglement. And um, alternatively, you can think of it in terms of operator spreading and the dynamics of quantum information if you 
disturb the system at one point and ask how the effects of the disturbance uh, spread out. So uh, I think the new understanding has come partly from constructing some very simple tractable models. And these models uh, are the quantum circuits. And really the motivating ideas uh, are quite few. I mean, the first one is that you could say that one of the great lessons from random matrix theory is that although no individual um, generic quantum system is solvable, uh, we can calculate properties quite easily if we're willing to discuss averages over some kind of random ensemble. So the strategy that's used here is to uh, combine random matrices with some kind of uh, spatial structure so that you have um, models which uh, have the notion of locality built into them uh, from the spatial structure and which use the randomness uh, to give you something solvable. Um, and then the third point that's uh, maybe not obvious, but turns out to be quite important, is that since for the problems that we're trying to understand, uh, we're really interested in time revolution, uh, it's actually useful to uh, model the time revolution operator directly. So write down some model for a unitary uh, rather than uh, a model for the Hamiltonian. Uh, and that takes us to quantum circuits. Um, so to explain what they are, um, we can think in terms of this sort of space type time diagram. So suppose we have a, a one dimensional system, uh, although it doesn't have to be one dimensional. Uh, and we think of uh, a lattice and then at each lattice site, we have uh, some kind of generalized spin uh, with, uh, in the general case, uh, a Q-dimensional uh, local Hilbert space. Um, and uh, then time evolution involves a, a series of steps. So like uh, trotterized time evolution, but without any intention of making the uh, time, short, time steps uh, infinitesimal. Uh, and so uh, we apply in, in this example, uh, two site unitary gates uh, alternately across say the uh, odd bonds and the even bonds in the lattice. Uh, and so uh, build up some uh, dynamics. Um, and then you need randomness to have something that uh, has a chance of being tractable. And there are two ways of doing things. Um, you can either represent a problem where the Hamiltonian is random as a function of time. And what this picture is supposed to uh, uh, represent is uh, each gate uh, being chosen uh, independently of all of the others. Uh, and so the colors are all in, intended to be uh, independent of each other. Uh, but alternatively, uh, you could um, think about a blockade system so that you have some fixed uh, time evolution operator uh, and then uh, each gate acting on a given bond uh, will be the same realization of the randomness. Um, and in both cases, under certain conditions, you can do uh, exact calculations uh, in the uh, ergodic phase. Uh, so that's going to be my, my starting point, although uh, I'll also be interested in the transition to the MBL phase where we don't have uh, ways of, of doing things exactly. Um, and the particular language that I'm going to want to use when I talk about symmetry breaking is uh, in terms of uh, Feynman paths in, in folk space. Uh, whoops. And I've put paths in inverted commas because they're not 
really paths in phase space uh, the way uh, Feynman introduced them. Uh, I simply mean that uh, if we have uh, the evolution operator, say, over T time steps of uh, the flock A system uh, between some initial state and a final state, and we uh, expand all of this out. Uh, so by W of T, I simply mean the evolution operator for one flock A step uh, raised to the power T. If we expand all this out, then obviously I can express things in terms of a sum over intermediate states. And I want to think of one uh, sequence of labels in that sum as being a, a path in, in Fox space. Um, so there are lots of situations where, where you think about uh, contributions from paths. And if I think not about the amplitude for a transition, but rather uh, the probability, then of course I have a, a double sum over pairs of paths. And um, the diagonal term in that sum is necessarily positive. Uh, and so if we can uh, drop the fluctuations for some reason or other, then uh, we've got something simpler to, that we can focus on. And um, there are lots of situations where uh, making that diagonal approximation has been uh, very useful. So uh, I think one of the first was in uh, semi-classical uh, calculations in, in quantum mechanics, uh, of course, developed by uh, Goodsfiller and applied to chaotic systems by, by Berry, um, where you have a theory of energy levels based on uh, periodic orbits uh, treated within this diagonal approximation. And if we think about disordered conductors, then, of course, all of the understanding based on uh, diffusons and couperons, uh, again, is uh, in terms of this diagonal approximation. So my point is partly that in uh, these many body systems uh, based uh, on quantum circuits, for example, uh, everything is, is set up actually in order that the diagonal approximation is uh, a controlled treatment and these fluctuations uh, are either zero uh, after averaging over the random matrix ensemble or, or otherwise at least uh, under control. Now, I, I want to put that idea of uh, Feynman paths on one side for a bit and uh, talk first of all about this uh, way uh, that I want to use to characterize the uh, MBL transition uh, and uh, then about uh, symmetry breaking in the language of the transfer matrix. And uh, unless I run out of time badly, I'll come back to um, Feynman paths and, and symmetry breaking at the end. Um, so I'm going to think about Floquet systems from now on. So uh, I have a, a unitary matrix which uh, has some uh, eigenvalues and I want to uh, think about the spectral statistics of these eigenvalues. Uh, and I can do it in terms of what's called the spectral form factor, which is just the Fourier transform with T, the Fourier transform variable of the uh, two-point correlation function of, of these eigenvalues. Uh, and I can write it as the trace of the evolution operator over T time steps, where I'm, I'm using this notation here uh, to, to make it clear that T is not a, a matrix transpose. Um, and to remember what to expect in the behavior of the spectral form factor as a, a function of time, um, if the eigenphases are completely uncorrelated, then the only term in this double sum that survives the average is the diagonal one. And if we have n uncorrelated phases, then the spectral form factor is just uh, a constant n. Uh, but to have something to contrast with that, we can think about random matrices. 
and if we take uh, a uniformly distributed uh, ensemble of n by n unitary random matrices, then uh, at large values of time, we have the same behavior as for uh, a Poisson distributed set of energy levels, but uh, at shorter times, at times smaller than the Heisenberg time, the inverse of the level spacing, uh, you in fact have a, a spectral form factor that's uh, simply uh, linear in, in T and in fact equal to T in the units that I'm using. Um, so those two examples uh, are in fact good proxies um, for what happens in the two phases of a system with an MBL transition. So uh, in the MBL phase, uh, the levels are almost uh, Poisson distributed uh, and the spectral form factor behaves uh, as for Poisson levels after a, a time uh, set by some microscopic localization time. And uh, in uh, an uh, ergodic system, um, beyond some Thales time, uh, we get the random matrix behavior of the uh, spectral form factor. So, so the idea is that uh, the distinction between these two types of behavior is a pretty straightforward, uh, clear-cut way of distinguishing between the two phases. Sure. Um, this probably doesn't, I mean, I agree that that would be a good definition of an MBL phase, uh, and I'd be happy to accept it. Uh, I probably ought to say that that's, it, it's not obvious uh, that this connects with that. Uh, and then to explain why it should connect with being non ergodic I think you probably want to go by the, uh, Elbit picture of an MBL phase, and um, then according to the Elbit picture, you get to this behavior of the spectral form factor. So I, I'd say there's something higher level, which uh, includes what you're saying about non egodicity and that leads to that behavior. Yeah. Is this like for the unitary random matrix? Why does it have a uh, Well, that's because of level repulsion, really, which says that the um, short wavelength components in the spectral density fluctuate much less than uh, if there weren't any correlations between the levels. Okay, so, so now I want to take it as accepted that the uh, spectral form factor is a good diagnostic for the transition. And, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, calculating the spectral form factor. Uh, and so here's some pictorial notation. Uh, so this is the picture in space and time that I had of uh, quantum circuits. And um, I said the spectral form factor is the uh, modular squared of the trace of the evolution operator over T time steps. So taking the trace, we uh, wrap this circuit on a cylinder in the time direction. Um, and uh, that's what I'm representing here without, of course, the details of the gates. Uh, and uh, so the, the spectral form factor, that's the uh, modular squared uh, of, of the trace. So I need two of these cylinders and I'm drawing one in blue and one in green. Um, and once I've, well, I, I, and then when I think about the details that I've left out here and contracting these gates, I can think about evaluating the spectral form factor either the way that I did originally contracting the gates in the time direction, so going around the circumference of the cylinder, or, or alternatively, uh, I could uh, operate in the space direction 
uh, taking uh, slices. Um, and if I choose to do it that second way, then once I've averaged over disorder, then I'll have uh, a translationally invariant transfer matrix, uh, which gives me uh, the spectral form factor. So this is the central object in, in what I want to talk about, and it's partly the spectrum of this transfer matrix that gives uh, an analogy with uh, problems in statistical mechanics uh, where you have phase transitions. Um, so, of course, as in uh, statistical mechanics, it'll be the leading eigenvalues of this transfer matrix uh, which uh, tell us the spectral form factor. Um, and what generically happens uh, in a transfer matrix description of a problem uh, when you have uh, symmetry breaking is that you get degeneracy of the leading eigenvalues, and it's that uh, feature which you also find in the MBL transition in these Floquet models. So actually we can see what we should find um, in the spectrum of the transfer matrix in each of the two phases, just on the basis of what I said happens to the spectral form factor in, in the two phases. So, uh, I mean, I'm ordering the eigenvalues by their magnitude and uh, in the usual way, uh, the spectral form factor in a system of length L is given by a sum over these eigenvalues raised to the power L. Um, so in the ergodic phase uh, on time smaller than the Heisenberg time, uh, I said that the spectral form factor is just equal to uh, the integer, integer valued time. Uh, and uh, then of course, that's independent of the system length. So in order for that to work out, we need the leading eigenvalues just to be unity. Uh, and then we have some subleading eigenvalues, but they're less than one. So if L is large, they don't contribute. And that having eigenvalues equal to one, that's enough to have a spectral form factor that's independent of the length of the system. But to have the value of the spectral form factor given by the number of block A periods T, uh, we need to have T of these eigenvalues uh, degenerate and, and equal to one. Um, whereas in the MBL phase, the uh, spectral form factor is simply uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space. And if I have a local Hilbert space dimension uh, Q, then in an L site system, the overall Hilbert space dimension is Q to the L. And what we require uh, from the eigenvalues to reproduce that behavior is that the uh, leading eigenvalue is, is simply Q, uh, so that raising it to the Lth power uh, gives the uh, behavior we're looking for. Um, and, and so uh, in the ergodic phase, we have uh, these uh, degenerate eigenvalues, uh, uh, a signature of symmetry breaking, uh, and it's the uh, MBL phase that's the high symmetry phase. Okay, so that's what we should expect in principle. Uh, what's the evidence that it actually happens? Well, we've got two bits of evidence. I'm only going to tell you about one of them. Um, in the uh, ergodic phase, uh, there's a way of uh, constructing um, these quantum circuits that uh, exactly solvable in the limit of, of uh, large local Hilbert space dimension. Uh, and uh, you can verify that that gives exactly the behavior I've talked about from the uh, transfer matrix. Uh, but you can also go to a problem that's uh, more generic in the sense that it doesn't use this large Q limit uh, and that uh, importantly gives you access to both phases. Uh, and then you can do numerics, and, and it's uh, that evidence that I will talk about. Um, so the specific problem that we, we studied to do numerics on, it's um, uh, a spin a half chain, and it's basically uh, a, a kicked uh, in the sense of uh, a flock A system, uh, random field Heisenberg spin chain. Um, so the flock A operator 
is uh, defined pictorially by this arrangement of gates, uh, as in the systems I talked about in the introduction. And uh, an individual, one of these gates uh, has two factors to it. Uh, partly, we evolve the pair of sites that the gate couples uh, under uh, a standard uh, Heisenberg interaction with some strength J. Uh, and then for the uh, other part of the time, we uh, evolve the two sites independently in random fields. Uh, and these are random fields chosen to generate uh, uh, YouTube rotations of the spinner halves. And as you'd expect, uh, if the Heisenberg coupling is small, then you're in an MBL phase. And if the coupling is large, uh, you're in uh, an ergodic phase. So you can study this model in all the ways that people do uh, for MBL transitions, but uh, I want to talk specifically about this uh, transfer matrix approach. And um, in particular, you can look at the behavior of the leading eigenvalue of this transfer matrix uh, as a function of the number of block A steps uh, for different values of the coupling that take you between the MBL phase up here in blue and uh, the ergodic phase down here in red. So what you see is that at intermediate times, uh, there's behavior that's not so clear cut, but if you go to long times, then um, in the MBL phase, the leading eigenvalue is simply uh, the dimension of the local Hilbert space. Uh, so that's two in this spin a half model. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, in the uh, ergodic phase, uh, thermal phase, uh, the leading eigenvalue is one. Um, and then you can look at the degeneracy of uh, these eigenvalues. Uh, basically by looking at the spectral form factor, which has con contributions from all of the eigenvalues divided by the uh, leading eigenvalue. And so if there's only uh, one uh, leading eigenvalue, then this ratio will be unity, uh, which is uh, what happens in the um, MBL phase. Uh, but if there are uh, T, uh, degenerate eigenvalues, uh, which is what I argued should happen in the uh, ergodic phase, uh, then uh, this ratio will be proportional to T. Uh, and again, that's uh, what we find uh, at long times. So, so the, the argument is that uh, exactly the, the behavior that uh, we anticipated uh, comes out in the numerics uh, for the transfer matrix uh, in this model. So um, then the remaining thing is to talk a little bit about uh, what the symmetry breaking actually is that's implied by the degeneracy of the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix um, in the uh, ergodic phase. So for that, I want to go back to the uh, diagonal approximation, uh, the idea that if you uh, work out the probability, say, to get between an initial and a final state, you can uh, expand it in terms of amplitudes associated with paths in Fox space and pick out a, a diagonal term uh, where the uh, phases uh, from the two contributions cancel. So in the simplest case of a, a transition between an initial and a final state, uh, the paths that pair uh, in the diagonal approximation are exactly the ones where this label Q is the same as P. But this kind of phase cancellation can sometimes involve not just uh, a unique path, but rather a set of paths. And actually, that's exactly what happens if we think about a calculation of the spectral form factor. So. Um, these pictures are supposed to represent the calculation of the spectral form factor. And uh, of course, that's the modular squared of the trace of the evolution operator raised to a certain power. So 
uh, the green loop is supposed to represent uh, a particular contribution uh, to the trace. And it's, uh, of course, a closed loop like the cylinders that I had in the other pictures uh, because I'm taking the trace. Uh, and then the blue path is supposed to represent uh, a contribution to the complex conjugate. And um, I get uh, phase cancellation if the two paths are the same, but I also get phase cancellation if I offset the origin for one of the traces by either one time step or two time steps or more time steps. And it's exactly that kind of constructive interference that leads to a linear in T behavior for the spectral form factor. Um, now, those pictures, uh, uh, I think, are uh, a faithful representation of what happens um, in, uh, for instance, uh, random matrix theory. Um, but when we go to a spatially extended system, then you have a possibility of one particular kind of pairing between the paths in one domain and a different kind of pairing in uh, another domain. And um, the question is whether the system breaks up or the contributions to the spectral form factor break up into uh, many separate domains or not. And uh, the kind of long range uh, order in the uh, ergodic phase is uh, exactly the uh, formation of a, a single domain for this pairing and the absence of long range order in the MBL phase, I think, is uh, exactly a, a, a proliferation of, of these domain walls. So the last point I want to make is to do with uh, some uh, more numerics. And so we can try and introduce a local order parameter, which tells us about the pairing of these paths. So uh, there's a bit of notation here, but I hope it is digestible. So let's focus on what the spin is doing uh, at a particular site X in the system as a function of time in some path in bulk space that contributes to the trace of the uh, flock A operator over T time steps. Uh, so uh, for a given path in bulk space, then uh, I'll have a, a sequence of orientations for the spin in whatever basis I'm using. And um, if I think about a contribution to uh, the complex conjugate that I need to combine with this first trace in order to get the um, spectral form factor, then uh, I have some other path in Fox space at that site. Uh, and um, if I have the kind of pairing that I was representing either here uh, or, or, um, or over here, then I can recognize it by saying that the paths are the same and I can ask what the offset is between the two paths. In other words, whether these starting points are the same or, or different. Um, by looking at these two sequences of spins uh, and gauging what this offset is. So what we want to do is construct a, an order parameter that tells us uh, whether the two sequences are the same and if they are what this offset is. And basically you can write something down with Delta functions and so on, which has a, a phase that tells you the uh, offset and uh, a magnitude that tells you the fraction of uh, the uh, states in uh, the one path that match states uh, with a given offset in the other path. So this is a, a local order parameter, um, but as usual, unless you apply uh, a symmetry breaking field, which we're not going to, uh, to probe long range order, you need to look at a two point function. So 
we make a two-point function out of this local order parameter in the usual way. Uh, and then these averages are averages over the paths in Fox space that contribute to the spectral form factor. And uh, the basic result is that this um, correlation function shows long range order in the ergodic phase and uh, only short range order in the uh, MBL phase. So uh, this is uh, data admittedly from uh, very short systems, uh, but uh, we see uh, exactly this uh, difference between uh, order at least over the length of the system in the uh, thermal phase and uh, only short range correlations in the MBL phase. So um, that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, so the messages are that the MBL transition is signaled in this transfer matrix spectrum. Uh, and uh, the idea of the diagonal approximation that's familiar, say in uh, treatments of single particle problems in disordered conductors uh, in terms of uh, diffusons and couperons, uh, that uh, gives us uh, a description of the uh, gothic phase. And um, when you um, think about a quantity such as the spectral form factor, then uh, you have some freedom in the pairing of the Feynman paths that contribute to the uh, uh, to the spectral form factor within the diagonal approximation, and and that pairing is a form of of long range order, and it's exactly this long range order that disappears at the MBL transition. Thanks. Questions. Do you have a feeling for whether this transition occurs continuously or discontinuously? Um, well, I think there's a general strong presumption that it should be continuous. Uh, we, so far anyway, have deliberately stayed away from the transition because of course, uh, it seems to be very hard to, uh, get reliable results on it from numerics uh, in the uh, available system sizes. So, I mean, our approach has been to uh, try and nail down what's going on in the two phases and uh, uh, postpone uh, talking about what's happening at, actually at the transition. I mean, I think there's a, a kind of qualitative picture that you can imagine in terms of these domain walls uh, proliferating as you go through the transition, then that's sort of what happens at uh, continuous thermal transitions. But I don't think, uh, I haven't got anything more to, you know, solid to say about why the transition should be continuous, except that it's quite hard to have, it's, it's harder to have first order transitions in random systems. Uh, um, uh, what happens if one considers uh, unitaries that are specially extended, so the number of gates is larger than two, or introduces, let's say, unitaries with random number of gates or some flow case states, time periodic flow case states for unitaries that are uh, like multi leg type. But I guess what I'm asking is how, how universal are MBL transitions with respect to uh, special extent of unitaries? Um, well, I guess what I can say is mostly prejudice uh, rather than uh, based on, on specific calculations. But uh, I mean, I suppose what you'd expect is that um, if you have gates that couple more than two sites at a time, it tends to make the ergodic phase uh, more stable and the MBL phase less stable. But if the coupling that the gates induce is sufficiently weak, then 
you should be able to have an MBL phase with uh, three site or four site gates. But uh, I mean, I think it's reasonable prejudice, but it's more prejudice in calculation. Uh, in some toy, toy models, which are actually not interacting, uh, there is a peculiar situation where uh, the uh, eigenstates are ergodic, but in a squeezed uh, part mm. of the of the space of all available space. For instance, this Rosenberg for the model is such. Yeah. Uh, and what kind of behavior would you? Uh, expect if this uh, would take place uh, for some uh, quantum circuits. Uh, so you, you have two, uh, two types of behavior. Either it goes to one or it is go uh, going uh, at large time to Q. Suppose that you have a situation where uh, not uh, every uh, corner of um, Hilbert space is visited, but uh, on the manifold, sub manifold of, of the Hilbert space, you have uh, totally ergodic distribution. Well, I think, I mean, the understanding is that the states in the MBL phase uh, are um, partially extended in Fox space in the way that you say. I mean, they they involve a divergent number of basis states in Fox space, but a vanishing fraction of the total set of basis states in Fox space. But in the MBL problem, that's consistent with the behavior that I showed for the spectral form factor, which uh, reaches Poisson behavior after a, a finite time. So it may be that that's different from what happens in random regular graphs. Okay. I don't see more questions here. For some reason, I think there's something in the chat that doesn't show up on my computer. So we'll have to uh, check it okay. here. Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to read it or should I? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait, the, sorry, I'm scrolling in the wrong direction. Um, uh, yeah, Pierce, Pierce said uh, he explains why he can't come. Um, is, is a glass, uh, well, this is Pierce to everyone. Uh, so is a glass an MBL phase? If not, what's the distinction? Uh, and then he says, uh, if need be, uh, think about a, a quantum glass. Um, right. Uh, so, Does anyone else want to say something about, I mean, it's addressed to everyone uh, or, or, or maybe it's addressed to me, I'm not sure. Um, Yeah, well, I guess one point in a spatially extended system would be that um, you could imagine having something that you'd be happy to call glassy because uh, particles didn't move, uh, but uh, it would still conduct heat. Whereas in a MBL phase, you want uh, all excitations to be localized. Um, and uh, yeah, no. Well, Pierce was terrifying that he meant that to me. Um, and yeah, then then there was a question about uh, time crystals and could we use the transfer matrix spectrum to find uh, a time crystal phase? Um, 
so um so really the the question is what what happens if you think about time crystals in the language that i was using um in other words the language of the spectral form factor so time crystals um do have a characteristic feature in the um spectrum of the evolution operator but it's to do with correlations between uh, eigenvalues on opposite sides of the unit circle. Uh, so I don't think the kind of transfer matrix uh, approach to the spectral form factor that I was talking about would particularly shed any light on that. Perhaps you could devise a different kind of transfer matrix that would be useful. All right, I don't see any more questions, neither here or in the chat. So let's thank John again. Um, are there, I guess we are past the question.